Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Smith, and I am the communication lead in the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch at the Division of Public Health, and I will be uh, getting us started today. Welcome to our virtual OPDAC meeting on justice system diversion. Um, we're going to have a poll that's going to come up on the screen, and we just ask that you um, choose the category that best fits your organization. And if you choose other, we just ask you to please list it into the, in the chat. Um, also want to just give you some few housekeeping notes. Please take breaks as needed. I know a two hour virtual meeting can be a lot. So just please take breaks as you can. Um, and if you have questions for speakers, please use the Q&A during each of the sessions. We will have staff monitoring them throughout the remainder of the meeting. And we will try to get to your questions as we can, but if we are not able to, depending on time, we will make sure to follow up with you after the meeting to ensure that all of your questions have been answered. And so I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction. Margaret Bordeaux is our Justice Involved Overdose Prevention Specialist. She is a CDC Foundation assignee and she is housed within the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch at the Division of Public Health. And she's gonna open this morning's discussion and she's gonna give us some background on our topic today, which as I mentioned is justice system diversion and strategy, just, excuse me, justice system diversion strategies to prevent overdose and overdose fatalities. We are going to have presentations from researchers at UNC and Duke, and they're going to share their findings from groundbreaking landscape analysis of pre and post arrest diversion programs across the state and their evaluation. We are also going to um, spotlight two programs that have implemented diversion programs in their communities to connect individuals who are justice involved to treatment and care and away from further justice involvement. And before closing today's meeting, we will hear from other researchers from the Duke Opioid Collaboratory to introduce the audience to two new justice involved population focus articles. And I just wanna thank you everyone for all your support who will be supporting us in the chat and that who have made this um, meeting possible today. And now I will turn it over to Margaret. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. I'm Margaret Bordeaux, as Sarah has uh, introduced me before. Um, today's OPDAC meeting um, is very true to um, things we've done in the past, had a justice um, involved population theme OPDAC meeting for the last few Decembers and wanted to stay with that theme, but this time looking at justice system diversion programs. Um, these programs work to make our communities safer and the citizens healthier by providing alternatives and just different pathways um, that people who um, are justice involved can navigate through that system and really want to focus on diversion being a, a preventative um, strategy for uh, overdose and reducing overdoses among justice involved individuals. Um, and there's many different ways to look at it. But one of the ways that I always hold um, on true is that if um, we know from research that post incarceration is a riskier time for people who are involved in the criminal system, then the more that we divert them away from incarceration, um, we will reduce um, overdose in that population but again, other ways to practice diversion throughout the system. Um, we'll hear about some pre-arrest diversion programs that uh, happen before a person is um, arrested or ever um, detained. Um, we'll hear about some post-arrest strategies. Sometimes we recognize that um, we play as gatekeepers to a lot of these resources. So we want to make sure that the resources really follow that sequential intercept. And so post-arrest diversion programs are opportunities to engage with folks who did not have an opportunity for pre-arrest diversion. Um, there's only limited spaces for those programs. We'll hear about all the fine programs in North Carolina, but we will see that there's a need for so much more work around diversion in our state. Um, and then we can just also think about how um, supporting folks when they're back in the community is a way that we can reduce um, overdose fatalities in that population. Um, the, if people aren't recidivating into that system, again, they're not carrying that risk. So having um, 
available diversion programs that can really meet people where they are in the justice system is really important. And so I have been excited to learn about the research presentations that you'll hear today and to see the programs that are going to be highlighted grow. Um, a lot of this work started with very early conversations that I had the privilege to be a part of. So I hope that people are as excited as I am for today's OPDAT meeting. Um, and at this turn, I'm going to hand it over to Eliza and Madeline. Hello, everyone. So happy to be here. I'm just going to set up the slideshow really quick. Can everyone see that? Hearing nothing. Yes, yes. looks good. We can see you. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. My name is Eliza Filene and I'm a second year medical student at UNC. Uh, my name is Madeline Frank. I am a second year student at UNC in the dual master's program in social work and public health. And we are so happy to be here today on behalf of our team from the UNC Injury Prevention Research Center in partnership with DPH. Excited to start a conversation today about our environmental scan of substance use related pre and post arrest diversion programs in North Carolina. All right. Um, so um, today we will start with a brief overview of our methods um, for this environmental scan, um, go over some results, and then talk about some of the diversion, diversion program needs and uh, some concluding thoughts. Um, so our main aim in this project was to identify and examine some substance use related pre and post arrest diversion programs in all 100 counties in North Carolina. We want to start off talking about how we define diversion. So we talked about diversion in this report as specifically interventions that aim to reduce the number of people who are sent to jail or prison for substance use related charges. There are lots of ways to use that word diversion to talk about preventing um, folks from remitting to their substance use after a program, but we're talking specifically about charge diversion here. Um, we only included programs whose population focused on individuals with substance use disorders. Um, so therefore, we unfortunately had to leave out programs like mental health treatment courts, um, community policing, crisis response teams, um, misdemeanor diversion. Um, we had to leave out programs such as mental health treatment courts and um, street outreach programs, as well as programs that provide medication for opioid use disorders to incarcerated individuals. But these programs are really important to the landscape of pre and post diversion programs overall. And our definition was somewhat arbitra arbitrary in nature. So in terms of data collection, um, we first developed a survey um, in conjunction with DPH and IPRIC um, to capture existing programs and key programmatic characteristics. Uh, we created a database of contacts in each county of North Carolina with potential knowledge of these programs and started from a publicly available list of known diversion program contacts um, across North Carolina, which was supplied by the Division of Public Health and collected through their opioid and substance use action plan data dashboard collection efforts. Uh, we then supplemented this list with web searches on potential contacts from district attorney's offices, sheriff's offices, um, local health departments, and other organizations that tend to coordinate these uh, substance use related diversion programs. Um, we reached out through both email and phone using a standardized template to a minimum of three contacts three to four times per county. And then we conducted interviews, um, if possible, using a structured interview guide, primarily through phone and Zoom. Um, we recorded the interviews if the interviewee consented um, and then took detailed notes throughout the interviews. And these usually lasted between 45 minutes and one hour. Um, and something else to note is that we did ask programs for outcome data if available, um, but it is self-reported. So we were not able to verify any of the outcome data. Great, so hearing from a county meant that we spoke with someone who told us the status of the programs in that county. Um, and we conducted interviews specifically with folks who were representatives of a county um, with a program. And then there, these are just some of the numbers on the screen here. So as you can see, we reached out to all 100 counties in the state. 
Um, we heard back from 98 counties who shared with us they either did or did not have a substance use related pre or post arrest diversion program. Um, there was only one county that did not want to speak with us about the status of the programs. Um, and then there were 30 counties that had pre arrest diversion programs, 43 counties that had post arrest diversion programs. Um, some programs we did count as both pre and post arrest. And then there were 16 that had both a pre arrest and a post arrest program. Okay, so maybe some of you on the call are very familiar with these types of programs, but we, but we thought we would just run through them because there are so many different types of diversion programs in North Carolina. So lead programs are specifically law enforcement diversion programs, oftentimes based out of police departments, and they vary greatly from county to county, but lead is a national model. Um, we define lead adjacent programs as programs that directly involve law enforcement or based out of law enforcement, utilize those referrals, but were not called lead programs. And these tended to be more unique to each county's needs. Um, Co-responder programs are programs where a behavioral health specialist or a peer support spe specialist is accompanying law enforcement to the scene when someone is having a substance use or a mental health crisis. And then on the other side, here on the right, um, we have substance use related post arrest diversion programs. You can see there are um, a few more kinds of these in the pre arrest. Um, so, the first kind, a drug treatment court, these generally aim to serve individuals with substance use disorders, um, most of whom have had prior involvement with the criminal legal system. And program participation is usually offered post arrest and post conviction as a probationary condition. Um, and while the offense does not directly have to involve substances, a substance use disorder does have to underlie the charge. Um, and as you'll see with a lot of these uh, post arrest diversion programs, it operates in a phased system and is very much a team approach. Um, a DWI court or a sobriety court um, is very similar to a drug treatment court, but serves individuals who have substance use disorders and have committed a DWI offense. Um, a veterans treatment court, also very similar to drug treatment courts and DWI courts, um, but serve criminal legal system involved veterans with substance use disorders and or co-occurring mental health diagnosis. And a key differentiator of this program is the peer mentorship component, um, which is also present in the family drug treatment court, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, Stepping Up is a nationwide program that has aims to reduce the number of individuals with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders in jails and prisons. And it's meant to be a pre or a post arrest program, but in practice, it's usually a post arrest program. Um, and while 46 counties in North Carolina have adopted resolutions to support the Stepping Up initiative, only six counties shared with us using Stepping Up as a concrete diversion program. Um, and post jail booking, usually these individuals are connected to treatment as a conditional discharge. Um, we then had an other category, an other post arrest diversion category, and these were programs that didn't fit into any of the above categories and were highly unique to each county. Um, so just as two examples, um, one was called DATA or the District Attorney's Treatment Alternative in Forsyth County, which is a one year deferred prosecution program requiring Vivitrol injections, um, substance use and or mental health treatment, depending on the needs of the individual and electronic monitoring. Um, and another example is a program in New Hanover County called the Underage Drinking and Fake IDs Deferred Prosecution, um, which is, is a deferred prosecution program for individuals individuals accused of underage drinking or a fake ID offense. And these defendants complete community service, alcohol education, and observe incoming traumas at New Hanover Regional Medical Center and Recovery Court as a pathway to charge dismissal. Um, so the Prime for Life program is a re really unique evidence-based early intervention program, um, primarily aimed at first time and low level offenders who are deemed to benefit from guidance um, and sort of education around substance use disorders and it consists of a 12 hour prevention focused curriculum taught by local organizations such as the Mountain Projects Incorporated as well as the Appalachian Community Services. Um, and it focuses on both drug and alcohol use. And like these other programs, they receive referrals from the district attorney. And then our last two programs, um, Family Drug Treatment Court operates in a very similar manner to Drug Treatment Court, Veterans Treatment Court, and DWI Court, um, but just operates in Abuse, Neglect, and Dependency Court as opposed to within the criminal court system. 
Um, and then the last kind of other category that's not on here, but that we wanted to touch on is uh, 9096 and conditional discharge. So many counties that did not have a substance use related pre or post arrest diversion program cited North Carolina general statute 9096 as a policy used to divert individuals following arrest. And under this statute, first time offenders accused of minor drug and alcohol offenses, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, must be given the option to have their charges deferred. Um, and another policy that counties without diversion programs cited was a conditional discharge and deferred prosecution program for low level drug and alcohol charges. And this really looked different in every county, but generally this meant that the DA offered to defer um, an individual's charge under the agreement that they admit guilt to the charge and then agreed to attend substance use order treatment. Um, and then if they completed treatment and provided the court with proof of completion, their charge was dismissed. And oftentimes, um, folks shared with us that they would use this kind of more informal deferred prosecution as a way to avoid a formal 9096 um, as once someone has used used a, a 9096 that cannot be um, invoked again. Okay, um, just to pique your interest, I encourage you to pull up the report after our presentation. This is some of the sections um, we specifically looked at pre and post arrest uh, programs in North Carolina, the key characteristics, um, statistics on counties that have these programs, and these are just some of the sections that you will see. Um, and then this is just um, a screenshot of a table that we made that is um, also in the report, uh, which includes the name of each county, um, whether they have a substance use uh, pre and or post arrest diversion program and the year it began, a brief explanation of the program, the program's funding mechanism, any available outcome data and the best contacts or contact for the program. Um, and we're really excited to have this and hope that folks can use this to kind of see what's happening more broadly across the state and connect with each other. Um, and also something we just wanted to note is that um, this is an Excel file and there's a lot more information than first period. So you have to click on some of the cells to expand. Yes, click the cells. Um, so uh, we wanted to highlight some of our key takeaways from um, this environmental scan. The first is that staff are extremely dedicated to these programs and many have personal connections and experience um, to diversion and substance use that have drawn them to this work in the first place. Um, funding was something we heard as a need from almost every single program we spoke with, especially the drug treatment courts who shared with us their struggles in acquiring funding when the North Carolina legislature stopped all funding for these programs in 2011. Um, and again and again, we heard about the extraordinary lack of treatment facilities, um, both mental health and substance use treatment facilities and social service resources more generally in rural counties. Um, for example, one county shared with us that they often had no choice but to send individuals with um, facilities hours away and across the state for treatment. And programs also cited a specific need for inpatient treatment facilities um, that accept folks with a history of violent offenses and for high need, um, high needs individuals with a dual mental health substance use diagnosis. Um, there were many post-arrest programs too where severe and persistent mental illness like schizophrenia was an exclusion criteria for program participation due to capacity constraints. Um, and you know this is problematic for several reasons, one of which as it is it leaves individuals with severe and persistent mental illness without other diversion options. Um, and then rural counties also spoke with us um, quite frequently about the difficulties of acquiring, uh, of connecting participants with transportation. And this was discussed as a crucial resource gap, um, as many of these programs require, for example, drug testing um, several times a week or treatment, mental health substance use treatment several times a week. And so if participants were not able to acquire transportation to submit these drug screens or attend treatment, they're considered non-compliant with programs and may be discharged before completion. Um, as you may imagine, community partnerships are so integral to these programs. Um, we heard again and again how having law enforcement um, buy-in and partnerships specifically can really literally make um, or break a program. Um, and we heard some incredible stories about collaboration in this space. Um, finally, specifically for pre-arrest programs, um, counties talked to us about the need for increasing education around substance use um, among both community and law enforcement um, in particular. There were several pre pre-arrest programs that told us about difficulties in getting law enforcement to utilize the programs even after the programs are established, um, noting that law enforcement may be hesitant to refrain from engaging in programs that they view being not tough on crime. Um, 
And these pre-arrest programs are utilized, of course, at the discretion of the arresting officer, inherently potentially reflecting officer bias, but also providing an opportunity for education and further partnership. Um, this is especially important to note as higher arrest rates for minoritized and especially black and, black and brown folks is well documented. On the flip side, as I mentioned, programs noted that it's um, law enforcement is such an important facilitator to getting these pre-arrest diversion programs off the ground and that when law enforcement is eager to engage, they may see great success. Um, we also want to emphasize that some of the programs that were most successful that we talked to actually had law enforcement leadership and buy-in at all levels or were maybe part of creating the program in the first place. And we also want to highlight that there is an increased need for technical assistance and data collection, as many counties might not have a manualized data collection process or methods in place and maybe didn't really know where to start. All right, so in terms of next steps, um, many counties across the state, whether they had pre or post arrest diversion programs in place or not, recognize the importance of these programs and expressed interest in starting one, if not already in place. Um, we have sent out this report and the spreadsheet to interviewees and community partners um, statewide, and we'll continue to find ways to make this information as useful and accessible as possible to community partners um, and stakeholders. And um, we've been accepted to present at the Academic Consortium on Criminal Justice Health Conference in April in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so we're really excited to um, continue to share our work there. Uh, and then we also have the eventual goal of assisting programs to develop minimum metrics for evaluation and a streamlined process to ease data collection. Okay, and these are some incredible resources that our PI Becky pulled, um, and these all have great resources, especially around technical assistance, um, bringing a lot of research information together in one place, and highlighting the um, importance of getting both law enforcement, healthcare, and public health all in one place. So we really encourage you to check out these resources. Um, the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative is specifically great for pulling a lot of that research synthesis, synthesis together. The National Council for Mental Well-Being um, also contains a lot of resources, as well as the Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative. And of course, the LEAD National Support Bureau is sort of the home for the LEAD national model. So thank you so much. Uh, we really enjoyed speaking with you all. On the right here is a, um, a little screenshot of our one pager, which you all should receive later. Um, and at the bottom there is a link to um, the report and the spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd love to take any questions now. And thank you both very much. I'm going to read a question that is um, meant for you. And so we'll answer this one live. This thing is from Roxanne Saucier. Thank you for this presentation. We know from other UNC research that Vivitrol treatment carries a higher risk of overdose than methadone or buprenorphine treatment and is often not individuals preferred treatment. Did you look at what percentage of these programs allow all three FDA approved forms of medication for opioid use disorder? Yeah, so thank you for this question. Um, this is definitely a really important uh, important point. Um, we were not able to um, look at which programs exactly allowed all three FDA um, approved forms of MOUD, um, but that is definitely something that that is for of further interest. And I think that we also found that it was of further interest for the people who were heading up the programs themselves. Um, so thank you. And I do know that um, for some programs that chose to use Vivitrol, um, it was a specifically a form of MOUD, I think that was allowed in that carceral setting. Um, I think some other forms like methadone and buprenorphine were not allowed in certain settings. Thank you. And so, yeah, everybody will get a copy of, of it'll be sent as an attachment um, after this meeting of the document that they showed. Um, I see 
Other question in the chat, is there any effort to coordinate the drug diversion response across the whole state of North Carolina? So I don't know necessarily if that's the question um, for you too, but I would love to uh, see if you have a response. Um, we hope to see that. And that was something that we were just so excited about with this report is just the chance to get everyone's names in one document, the chance to make a living document that we hope can change over time. We hope that you all message us like, hey, you forgot X, Y, Z. That's the point of this is to start the conversation and to create um, the beginning of a conversation that can hopefully get everyone on the same page and, and share resources and contacts. Yeah, and just to kind of echo what Eliza was saying, you know, something we heard a lot was that people who were, you know, running these programs even might not have known what was happening in the county over. Um, and so, yeah, just like Eliza said, we really hope that this is useful for folks across state and to really connect to each other and try to have a more coordinated effort, um, although we know it is, it is quite difficult and, you know, every county's needs are very different. And something that was exciting for us is a lot of times one of the first places we would start was the DA's office and getting to, to talk to those folks and then talk to the folks who are working more on the ground and sometimes even connect the two of them um, was just a great example of how there's so many connections to be made in unexpected places at all levels. I can read the questions if that's easier for you all. I think we got a little lost in the chat. If you don't mind, that would be great, Margaret. Yeah. Is there any differentiation in drug alcohol poly users for paths of support? Um, I think a lot of times the resources are in the same place in the county. Um, and we saw some differentiation, of course, where you know programs that were specifically for folks in um, alcohol use recovery, mm -hmm. and then some specifically for opioid use or other drug use disorders. But um, I think a lot of times it is the same place. Yeah, and a lot of the programs categorize folks with um, multiple needs as just like high need, high risk, high needs individuals. Um, and those did, they, they, those paths for support did tend to, to be pretty similar. On drug court that divert individuals from the court system and or the result in a dismissal upon graduation rather than no incarceration. Um, Caitlin, do you mean like not, like the end result is that they're not incarcerated or that at no point are they incarcerated? At the end. Yeah, I mean, most of the, the drug courts, their goal was to um, divert the person from incarceration. So ideally the person never ends up incarcerated. Um, there were some programs that use what they call like quick dips. So as sanctions for not um, maybe meeting certain goals um, or requirements of the program, they would kind of put people in jail or prison for a day or two. Um, but the, the goal, is, oh, why not just miss all the case at the end? Okay. I think, yeah, I think usually the, the case was dismissed if the person was able to fully complete the program. Um, I will say, I mean, these completion rates looked different for every program across the state, but in general, um, the, the completion rates did tend to be um, pretty low, oftentimes in the 20 or 30 percent. But I do think dismissal was the goal. Yeah, for dismissal the was the end goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, folks may be in like sort of a probationary state while they're pr uh, completing the program, and then the case could be dismissed at the end. Um, and same with with lead programs, that process looked a little bit more unique for each county or program. You know, maybe sometimes the lead program just looks like getting someone into the program and they're never, you know, their arrest isn't ever fully processed because it's happening so on the ground. But I think with drug courts, you know, there, it's more specific. There is a case and then at the, at the end it's dismissed. Does that answer your question, Kate? Um, there are definitely other metrics than just completion of counseling. 
Yeah. Um, for, I mean, for most programs, it was, um, you know, many, passing many drug tests, um, completing uh, extended mental health and substance use treatment, um, acquiring a job, acquiring housing, oftentimes living in a substance-free space, um, having a certain amount of time where there were no other charges. Um, those tended to be to be the main things. Attending support groups and what they call like pro-social events, so I call it synonymous, um, other support groups like that. And so there are more questions coming in. We need to move on to the other presentation. Um, Eliza and Mela, I ask you if you can answer um, via the chat. Uh, no, also we have Scott Pressure Bell who's gonna help support in the chat, but also the Q&A. Maybe we can't answer the questions live, but we can do it by text. Or if we have time towards the end, we can circle back. But thank you both very much um, for that presentation and those findings. And thank you everybody for those really good questions. Um, yeah, and, and as we move forward, I'll try to read the questions and the comments out loud because there are some folks who have joined us by phone and they won't be able to see the comment section. But yeah, they, all great questions and comments. I'm really into the conversation today, everybody. So thank you for all of the support and conversation in the chat. Um, we will turn it over to you now, Allison. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, let me get situated here. I'm hoping, let's see. You all can see this in slideshow format. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay, well, Eliza and Madeline, I loved hearing about your work. Um, that's really exciting. And I think our group's work um, is really complementary to yours as well. Um, so I'm excited to be able to talk about ours too. Uh, my name is Allison Gilbert. I'm an associate professor in psychiatry at Duke. Uh, and I'll be talking today about our research team's uh, three-year study of law enforcement-assisted diversion programs, like Eliza and Madeline had um, introduced. Uh, we conducted a multi-site evaluation of North Carolina LEAD programs, and we'll talk about those and some highlights of our study findings um, for the next little while here. So... Uh, what is LEAD? And again, we've heard some about that already this morning. Um, law enforcement assisted diversion is a pre-arrest criminal justice diversion program uh, that aims to serve people who, in the community who use drugs and are at risk of being charged with low-level criminal offenses. Um, LEAD is really a progressive and unique collaboration between multiple community partners, including law enforcement, uh, case management providers, um, clinical, uh, clinical providers, district attorneys, offices, uh, and other community stakeholders. So what, how the program works is that law enforcement will encounter individuals in the community who do use drugs, uh, and often are at very high risk of being charged with low level offenses that they may engage in those behaviors to help them be able to sustain their drug use. So that can be possession of paraphernalia, uh, possession of illegal drugs, uh, low level petty theft, shoplifting, that sort of thing. Um, what the program offers is the opportunity for, for law enforcement officers who are encountering individuals with these circumstances, uh, often multiple times, you know, over the course of time, gives them the opportunity at their discretion, and if it, the person is determined to be eligible, to refer individuals to the program in lieu of arrest for low-level low level criminal uh, unlawful conduct. If they do opt to make a referral to the program, uh, the law enforcement officer then transfers that individual um, over to lead staff agency person. And that's usually a case manager. 
Uh, ideally, there's a warm handoff where the case manager for the program can come to the scene of the referral and engage the person. They can then move along to uh, the case management office for um, an in-depth intake assessment. Um, at that point of the intake assessment, the lead staff assesses the wants and needs for resources and services for the individual that's coming into the program. And then from there forward, lead staff and outreach workers, case management, um, peer support services aim to connect people to a range of resources that they may want and need. Um, those can range from social services. It can be emergency services like connection to food, clothing, temporary housing, assistance in helping somebody secure longer term housing, connection to treatment services if um, participants in the program are interested in engaging in treatment. LEAD though is really rooted in harm reduction principles and the, the objective there and main purpose is to meet people where they are um, in their journey through drug use and potentially into recovery. So if somebody is still in active drug use and does want to engage with the program, they absolutely can do that. There is no expectation of treatment engagement. So if somebody just wants connection to harm reduction resources, say like needle exchange, naloxone, condoms, things that can help keep them safer during periods of active drug use, uh, that can absolutely be the extent to which they engage with the program. So LEAD um, was first developed and implemented in Seattle in 2011. Um, it was then, you know, since then it has diffused fairly widely across the United States. Uh, and we were particularly interested in studying LEAD in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina and its various stakeholders, including law enforcement, have really been pioneers in implementing this type of pre-arrest diversion program in the southeastern region of the United States. Um, the current lead programs that are, are actively operating are Fayetteville, Wilmington, um, Washington and Beaufort County, Catawba County, Burke County, and Watauga County. Um, Fayetteville was the first program to be implemented in, uh, in North Carolina. They started in 2016 and really in close partnership with North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. And this is a look at the four evaluation sites for our study. They included Wilmington, Fayetteville, Catawba County, uh, and Waynesville. Waynesville's program is not actively operating, but it was at the time during our evaluation. So we um, developed this evaluation um, and carried it out in really close partnership with North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, um, namely at the time, uh, Melissa Larson, who was working with NCHRC, um, and so worked you know, closely with her and the organization throughout, throughout our three-year evaluation. Um, funders for the project were the Duke Endowment and the Wilson Center uh, for Science and Justice at Duke Law. Uh, and some of the factors that went into, going back to our slide that shows our evaluation sites, some of the factors that went into consideration during recruiting study sites was we wanted a nice mix of um, sites located throughout the state, so representing both rural, suburban, and urban settings. Um, staff capacity was also just a real a, a practical um, need to be able to uh, collect data for the evaluation. So having a crime analyst at law enforcement agencies that were able to partner with us in um, sharing criminal justice data. Um, these were active sites that had been in operation long enough for us to be able to evaluate um, one year kind of pre and post engagement with the program for program participants, what program participation, how that was associated with some primary outcomes of interest. So we had a, again, it was a three-year evaluation from 2019 through 2022. We continue to do some secondary analysis. It was a mixed methods of uh, evaluation with both 
process and outcomes analyses. Um, for both of those process and outcome studies, we took both, uh, did quantitative analyses and qualitative uh, data collection as well. So overall, across our four study sites, we did uh, 22 interviews with lead participants. So that included structured survey content and open-ended interview questions um, that gave them opportunities to give in-depth uh, answers to open-ended questions. We conducted 27 in-depth stakeholder interviews um, with program partners like case managers, outreach workers, uh, lead law enforcement coordinators, district attorney's office representatives and clinical supervisors. We also conducted four focus groups with law enforcement officers from each of our sites. And then we collected a wide range of administrative data on criminal justice, um, related charges and incarcerations, uh, behavioral health care data from managed care organizations in, in, within each of uh, the jurisdictions catchment areas and various program data like intake assessments, case management notes, uh, and that sort of thing for a total of 244 people who were participating in the program uh, across the four sites. So just a, this is gonna be a really brief highlight of our study findings. Um, we have, and I'll point to that toward the end of, of the presentation, but um, have produced a full 90, play, 90 page report um, detailing our study findings. And we'll have various other products that are right on the cusp of uh, being available publicly um, and for wide dissemination. Uh, that another product that uh, summarizes our findings more than the full report, but for those who are interested in lots of detail, um, that will be available in the full report. So just as a brief highlight of our study findings here, what we were able to do um, with statistical analyses was look at a year prior and a year after having been participants having been referred in the program. We were also then able to construct comparison groups of people who were very similar, as similar as we could identify to lead participants and had lead eligible drug charges, but who were not referred to and did not enroll in the program. Uh, and so what this bar chart shows is our findings related to program participation and how that affected the risk of participants uh, either getting a criminal citation or arrest. And so we looked at rates of citations and arrests in for this analysis, it was six months before having been referred and enrolled in the program compared to the six months following having enrolled. Uh, and what we found was that citation and arrest rates were two times lower in the six months after having been referred to the program than they were in the six months before. So that indicates that being involved with LEAD really did significantly reduce people's uh, likelihood of being arrested. And then from the comparison group, we were able to generate estimates of what we would have expected um, LEAD participants what their arrest rates would have been, uh, what we would have expected them to have been if they had not engaged in the program. And there too, we found um, that the actual arrest rates after having engaged with the program were two times lower in the six months after they had been referred uh, compared to what we would have expected their arrest rate to be if they had not engaged in the program. We also took, um, a look at um, services that people ex uh, expressed interest in receiving and being connected to at the time of their intake into the program. And then also um, the extent to which or the proportion of program participants that received those types of services during program participation. Uh, and we found there was the majority of people coming in were interested in being connected to substance use treatment. Um, and that's interesting, too, because where the program does not impose treatment expectations, there really still was a lot of interest among participants coming into the program and being connected to those services. So close to 70% expressed interest in substance use treatment of some kind, um, and the same percent actually received and were connected to those services during their program participation. 
Um, there was also a lot of interest expressed in being connected to mental health counseling. 60% expressed interest and 47% actually connect, got connected to and received mental health services. There was also a lot of interest you'll see in employment and housing assistance. Uh, it was documented, we were able to collect these data from program documentation. So, so these may be underrepresented here if some service connections hadn't been documented um, in case management notes, say for example. But employment assistance and housing assistance were um, less likely to, those connections less likely to be made. And I think in part that's indicative of um, employment and housing resources being very scarce uh, across the state and, and including in our study jurisdictions. Um, and housing in particular, but employment too, being very difficult to connect people that have um, criminal conviction histories uh, to be able to help them connect to those services. So I'm going to go now over some findings, um, highlights of our process evaluation findings. Um, we did find that social referrals were much more likely to be made than arrest diversions. An arrest diversion was what I described at the beginning where an, a police officer can uh, opt to give a referral to the program in lieu of arresting somebody at the time that they're engaging in some sort of un, you know, low level unlawful uh, behavior. Social referrals though um, offer the opportunity for law enforcement officers to make referrals for folks, but maybe at a time that they that they think really could benefit from the program, but at a time where they're not engaging in any unlawful conduct. Uh, and so 70% of referrals to the program were social referrals, where 30% were arrest diversions. Um, we also found by looking at sociodemographic data among people who were referred to the programs, and then ultimately among those who were, were referred, those who went on to enroll, comparing those to uh, people who had within the entire jurisdiction lead eligible drug charges. Uh, and we found that lead referrals and enrollments were really disproportionately composed of women um, and white people as compared to men and people of color um, where and where white females were most likely to be referred and enrolled. And we found through our stakeholder interviews and focus groups, you know, some circumstances both involved in program practice and policy uh, that may have contributed to that. Um, we also found that on average, only about half of the people who were given a referral to lead went on to enroll. And that ranged from um, as low as 31% up to 67% of those referred going on to enroll in the, pro, uh, in the program across the study sites. So then we examined very closely like what some of the facilitators and barriers were to making referrals to the program and seeing those referrals converting to enrollments. Uh, some of the facilitators that we heard and all of these data that I'm presenting here are really from these are not observational data where we were making judgments about what was happening within the program, what were challenges and what were successes, but these are all um, responses and themes that we found coming from program stakeholders themselves uh, in, in study interviews uh, and focus groups. So some of the uh, facilitators to successful uh, referrals and enrollments were having supportive policing culture in the law enforcement agencies, that really fostering buy-in and active engagement with the program, law enforcement officers actively um, supportive of the program and wanting to make referrals as, as, as often and, and as possible. Uh, the capacity to be able to conduct warm handoffs between officer and lead staff on a 24 seven basis, ideally, uh, was considered to probably increase the chances that a referral would convert to an enrollment. In the cases where we warm handoffs weren't possible, the, the referring officer would give case management information, uh, contact information to the individual they re referred, um, and then that individual would have to take it upon themselves to make contact with case management, 
arrange an appointment for an intake assessment. It's important to note too that they in those cases they would have the individual had two weeks uh, to present for their intake assessment, and if they did not, then the the charges that had been diverted, um, if it was an arrest diversion, could be reinstated. Um, Programs that allowed community initiated referrals also was really considered to extend the reach of the program. A community initiated referral would be if like program staff people, case managers, and even community members were allowed to make an initial referral to the to the program. And then law enforcement officers would complete those referrals, namely by checking uh, to be sure that the individual were, uh, met eligibility criteria. So some of the barriers to making as many referrals and enrollments as the programs wanted to, um, restrictive eligibility requirements, we heard a, kind of across the board from stakeholders that would preclude officers from being able to refer people that they thought really could benefit from the program, but uh, could, but they could not because they didn't meet eligibility criteria. So an example of that is that one criterion is having no violent crime convictions in the past 10 years. Uh, so that could be really restrictive and potentially in a way that might categorically exclude certain socio-demographic groups um, from being able to be referred to the program. In some cases, um, there was also reported to be some lack of buy-in among police officers and maybe sometimes even a lack of awareness of the program and then that being associated with with there being fewer referrals made than they'd like to see. Um, and lack of awareness may be that, you know, there is often a, a lot, there can be significant turnover in law enforcement agencies among staff uh, and officers. And if there are not regular trainings taking place, then maybe incoming new officers wouldn't even be aware that they had that program in place in their agency. Uh, another barrier that was noted was really a lack of trust in law enforcement among the population of people that are being referred to the program. Um, and that may have decreed participants or prospective participants acceptance of a lead office uh, of a lead referral. So maybe where an officer would want to refer somebody to the program, but the person um, refused that referral because they are just basically have this like fundamental lack of trust. Uh, and so that's something you know, a long-standing problem, but but one to attend to. So what we did find too is that across all stakeholder groups, um, they all really strongly valued their programs and the impacts that it had. So we heard from, I have some examples here of what we heard from various program partners and stakeholders. So one lead participant said, without lead, I wouldn't be where I am today, hands down. I mean, it is a vital part of what got me clean and got me off the street and got my kid back, kids back in my home and made me feel like I'm doing what I need to do to contribute and be a better person. I really owe every good thing I have in my life right now to signing those papers that day. Um, one of uh, a lead program partner uh, had this to contribute. I had this attitude for most of my career. I didn't really understand the nature of disease. You're a police officer. You handle the problem. You move on to the next call for service. You don't really receive a lot of understanding of what's going on from a neurological perspective. Now we're finally getting that. And that was uh, something that a one of the law enforcement officers shared during a focus group. Um, let's see. And finally, as, as far as impact on community, one behavioral health care representative that we talked with said, it keeps people out of the local jail because, I, because, like I said, a lot of them can't make bond and they may stay in there for a while, which impacts their whole family system. So it's a ripple effect. So I think it's got a huge impact in the trajectory of the individual and their family. Oops. So we then, um, based on our study, finding, study findings, put together a set of recommendations um, for our for our study partners and their programs, but also for anybody, um, any jurisdictions that are considering implementing a lead program. Uh, some of those recommendations, and we have those in detail as well in our report, but they include um, 
as possible, including field-based uh, lead staff and program operations at all times, knowing that it's very important to have people in the field that are able to connect with program participants, check in with them regularly, see if they have things that they need support with. Um, another recommendation, like I'd mentioned just a minute ago, is to hold regular office trainings that, in, that are grounded in training on harm reduction principles um, and practices, ways in which their programs have been successful, and that would really be in the interest of increasing program awareness and buy-in among officers to get them um, to make as many referrals as they possibly can. Another recommendation is, is to review uh, program policy around eligibility criteria and consider expanding eligibility um, and loosening uh, eligibility criteria to be as inclusive uh, as possible of people who use drugs and can benefit from program services. Uh, we also recommend and have a separate document that details um, gives detailed recommendations about data collection for programs but recommend that they really systematically track demographic data on referrals, um, including people that were not given referrals, but who may have been el eligible, and also including for people who were offered referrals, but declined them. And that could really help with targeted outreach uh, to neighborhoods or socio-demographic groups uh, that are getting, that are not getting the, um, not getting referrals as much as others that might be within the jurisdiction. Uh, we also make a recommendation to aim for warm handoffs from law enforcement to lead staff at every referral um, as possible. That's often dictated by program staff capacity, um, often their lead their lead related work is kind of just in addition to work all of their full time work that they have in their case management responsibilities so there's a lot of strain on capacity for for program staff there. Uh, and finally, to encourage and strengthen um, engagement both by participants, but other community stakeholders to get as much buy in for the program as possible. So this is just a quick look I mentioned um, before like exactly what we're doing in terms of disseminating our study findings. We have this full 90 page report. We've got um, a policy brief that we're developing. We have a summary four page report that reflects um, the highlights of the 90 page report. And then we've got this um, this document that that offers detailed recommendations um, for lead programs and what kind of data collection and tracking they can do themselves within their own programs to see how operations are going and if outcomes uh, if they're achieving outcomes referrals enrollments um, in the way that they'd like to. So I'll stop there and I wonder if we have any time for questions we could we could do that and Ria if you're on and would like to join for any Q&A, that'd be wonderful. We totally have time for questions, Allison, and we've had some come through the chat um, while um, you were presenting. Scott, will you be able to read the questions from the chat for us? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Nadell asked how how are law enforcement making decisions for social referrals versus arrest diversions? Rhea, do you want to take that? Yeah, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, that decision is completely up to the officer. It just depends on whether or not they've encountered someone at a moment in which they would be able to charge the person or not. Um, and so if they can encounter someone in a moment where they're able to charge someone, then they can do a diversion. If they encounter someone who they think needs help in the community who is not doing any like criminalized activity, then they can make the referral as a social referral. Great, thank you. Uh, Catlin had a question for social referrals from law enforcement where no offense, uh, where no offense is committed is there any potential negative consequence for the individual if they don't engage? No, in that case, um, it's they have total freedom to decide to engage with the program or not, and there would be no negative consequence there. Um, 
what was interesting is we found that where the majority of referrals were social referrals, social referrals were less likely to go on um, to enroll in the program than people who were who were given arrest diversions. Uh, that's not too surprising given, you know, there was no negative potential consequence that they faced for not engaging with the program. Um, that said, people that are offered social referrals do likely have criminal pasts um, and histories and are still continue to be at risk um, for criminal charges in the future. So aiming to, to, to be better connect social referrals to um, move on to enrollments would be great. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Nitty had an earlier question, such great work. Uh, two times lower means half as, as likely, right? Yes. Great. Let me see scanning if there's some other ones. We did also, um, and I didn't present these findings here, that we did find um, also a significant increase in utilization of medications for treating opioid use disorder. So we have some behavioral health related findings too that we include in our in our brief report and in the full report. Looks like Alyssa had added some resources as well. So for those of you who are able to access chat, it's some of the trainings that the branch have provided. Um, yep, just, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. I think there's two in Q and A, Scott. Oh, Q and A, yep, thank you, sorry. Uh, Jordan asked, if it is up to officer's discretion, how is it, how is that navigated with officers who are not buying into the program? Rhea, would you like to answer? Yeah, so that is, that was a, the crux of a lot of our findings, um, which is that um, an officer who does not want to make a referral to lead does not have to at any point in their career as an officer. Um, so we found that a lot of um, law enforcement agencies, there'd be a small group of officers who were in fact making those referrals and a larger group that were not making them. Um, and the reasons for that, according to the officers who did make referrals, um, ranged from those other officers who weren't making referrals, just not knowing about the program, not opting to be trained in the program, not believing in the values of the program, um, not believing that the program will work. So there's a large range of reasons why officers might not uh, make a referral and they aren't required to. Um, and we go into like many, many details about that in our report. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a, uh, the report is really uh, incredible. So I, I definitely recommend folks take advantage of that. Uh, Molly also had another question, a uh, great presentation. For arrest referrals, do you have any breakdowns of the types of charges they were facing? Yeah, it was the large majority were either possession, um, uh, drug possession or paraphernalia. I think about 70%. Does that sound right, Rhea? Yeah. And for yeah. three out of the four sites, it was even much higher than that. Um, mm -hmm. And just, um, I know Allison mentioned that in the beginning, mentioned this in the beginning, but um, people can be diverted for charges that are related to petty theft or prostitution um, and, and other charges that uh, the officer may connect to drug use. Um, but we really weren't seeing that most of the officers at the sites were making diversion referrals for um, those types of charges. Thanks. Um, another question. How do we encourage a referral from a system whose budget is affected by their numbers? Um, I'm not sure that I entirely understand the question, but what I, I what I can say is um, all of these programs and you know across any kind of programming in in North Carolina and around the country really faces a lot of constraints around resources. Um, and we find that too. So even if you can get a successful referral and even enrollment in the program, um, the programs are limited in what they can connect people to in terms of services and resources, just because they're often scarce. Uh, and I think that you see that that's especially so um, in rural areas, but I think, you know, systems and agencies budgets is a, is a running challenge. Um, 
but I think we can still, you know, given resources that are available, I think there are, there are still, it is still worthwhile to encourage referrals um, and enrollments in the program. I think something that we heard from program participants that was really interesting um, was even just the connection to program staff and outreach workers, having people check in on them was of strong value to them. And maybe that's, you know, so that is, doesn't even involve um, engagement or connection to services, but just the, the fact that a human being was interested in them and their well being and checking in with them on a regular basis um, meant so much to them. So that's an example of ways in which, like, the budget isn't as important, um, but the human connection really was. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gilbert um, had asked, uh, do you provide ideas on ways to get officer buy in? Rio, do you want to take that? Yeah, so um, in the law enforcement focus groups, we asked the officers that question and um, they had a lot of really great responses, um, which are also outlined outlined in the report, but um, some of the ideas that they had, the, the most prevalent idea that they had across the sites was that um, officers need to know more about the outcomes of the LEAD program in their specific sites. There's a lot of evidence that LEAD, quote unquote, works at different parts of the country, but there's a perception, they believe there's a perception in their own law enforcement agency that if they don't know that it works at their, like in their jurisdiction, then um, officers are less likely to use it. So providing data and also stories about um, uh, it's like success stories. So if a law enforcement officer makes a referral to the program, having some follow-up um, from the case manager or someone else from the program about how that person that they referred are doing um, was perceived as a good way to gain buy-in. And then um, the final thing that we heard from a lot of people is that it really does depend on um, people who are higher up in um, the ranks of a law enforcement agency supporting the program. That was really critical. If there wasn't a lot of leadership um, in support of LEAD, um, there was less um, trickle down buy in, which was it's particularly true at one of our sites that was lacking and um, there was trouble with getting referrals made. A couple more questions, but let me know if we need to kind of curtail that and we can kind of take them offline. Uh, Guillermo asks, are there specific demographics that tend to opt out of the referral? What do you think the reasons are and what can be done to address that? I can speak to that too. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, it is not, the sites do not track um, the people that the officers refer but decline. Um, and so one of our recommendations for the sites is to be tracking that data regularly um, so that it's clear um, if there are specific demographic groups that are receiving referrals and declining, or if it's because we we noted that there's a disproportionate number of white women who are in the program and who are referred to the program. So we don't know if that's because law enforcement is more likely to refer those people or if those people are more likely to accept. Um, so further data collection is really needed to get at some of those inequities in the program. Yeah, and that's that's also in part why we recommend allowing community initiated referrals, I think, to be able to like ex extend the reach of the program and maybe to uh, address, you know, issues of distrust of law enforcement. If a community member could initiate that referral, it may be more likely that we'd we'd see um, people who have that distrust of law enforcement being willing to accept a referral and engage with the program. Outside of the LEAD program, have you all seen any changes in local policies? Um, not that I'm aware of. We are also in the process of just finishing up um, site-specific reports that, we're, that we'll be giving to our um, study site partners. And I think, you know, once they have that with the uh, study findings that are specific to their programs and their jurisdictions, that might be a time in which they'd review those carefully and consider making adaptations that help that that could help them um, help them make improvements uh, and expand referrals and enrollments. But other than that, I'm not at this time familiar or aware of other policy changes. Great, thank outside you. Outside of lead, that is. Sure. 
So Evan Ashkin uh, just had a, a, a closing comment. Um, we're doing TA across the state with lead and lead adjacent programs with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition, the Duke Opioid Collaboratory. As your data showed, connecting people to housing is a significant challenge and likely a common impediment to successful engagement. So with that, um, oh, we do have another question coming in again. If it's if I'm running over time, let me know. Uh, do you have a sense if lead programs housed within LEA work better than those housed at an outside agency? Rhea, do you want to answer? Yeah, I wouldn't say that our sites were necessarily housed within a law enforcement agency or housed in another agency. It was really more a collaboration across multiple agencies. Um, so I, it's hard to answer that question because I don't think any of the sites were really structured in such a way that they were housed within a specific agency. Okay, thanks for that. All right, I will turn it back over to Margaret. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And thank you so much, Allison and Rhea. That was interesting to learn. That was a very incredible body of work. Um, and I like all the products that are coming out of it. So thank you all very much for that. Um, we are going to shift a little bit now into some more community-based um, presentations. Very thankful to have um, all of the research that is supporting the work. But uh, we want to spotlight two programs who are really putting these things into practice. And so we will begin with Coastal Horizon Source Program. And then after we hear from them, we will hear from Robeson County Diversion. So thankful to those community-based partners for joining us today. All right, good morning. I am going to get my slides set up. Let's see. Okay. And as everyone else should. Oh, hold on. Okay, forgive me. I'm not used to using Zoom. Here we go. Okay. And can you guys still see my slides? We can. Okay, perfect. So my name is Jamie Melvin. As Margaret said, I am um, with Coastal Horizons, and I also have another co-presenter with me, so I will let him introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Billy McGowan. I'm the linkage coordinator um, here with the source program at Coastal Horizons in Wilmington. So um, I oversee, um, I wear a couple different hats with Coastal um, today. I'm going to be sharing sort of our reentry services. And so for those of you not familiar with Coastal Horizons, um, we are a large operation. We serve in some capacity over half of the state of North Carolina. Um, and so the mission is to promote healthier lives, stronger families, and safer communities. The bulk of our clinical services are offered kind of in the southern southeastern portion of North Carolina, um, but specifically our justice services reaches across 53 counties. Um, and then today what we'll be doing is sharing um, an overview of one of our reentry programs that is housed and operates specifically in New Hanover County, so down in Wilmington, North Carolina. <clears throat> okay, so as Margaret said, we're with the SOURCE program. It was a little bit of a mouthful, but it stands for Survivors of the Opioid COVID Epidemics their utilization of resources and community engagement. Um, and I'm really excited to be on this call today, especially after seeing um, both of those wonderful presentations on data, specifically with the LEAD program. So um, you'll hear a little bit about LEAD, Wilmington LEAD, as we are involved in that project, and it kind of ties into our source uh, model and our source funding. <clears throat> so the original source was created um, as a result Kind of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and we were looking for a way to assist individuals who were navigating treatment options, who wanted to look into harm reduction services, um, sub substance use services, recovery support services uh, upon their release from incarceration. And so originally we were funded in 2021 is when SOURCE was um, created and we enrolled our first participant. We set out to serve about 67 individuals during the time frame of May 21 through December of this year. Um, and then again, the goal was to assist 
in the effective and safe transition from incarceration to the community and um, in essence, reduce overdose risk. We work closely with community partners to ensure that we have, that we enroll folks and have access, they have access to safe housing, recovery support, treatment and harm reduction services. And so what was exciting is in February of 2022, we were presented with an opportunity to receive additional funding to kind of expand what we were already doing. Um, and that expansion really focused on two strategic approaches. Um, so the program began adding an overdose education um, component to what we were already doing. So now we are working to educate folks who are housed in the New Hanover County Detention Center um, on overdose risks and um, provide overdose prevention education. And then additionally, we got funding under another strategy um, that focused on diversion. So we really kind of tried to beef up our Wilmington LEAD program. Specifically, um, I worked a few years back with Rhea and the Duke team when they were doing the initial evaluation um, on the LEAD programs. And so I was kind of involved with LEAD from Coastal Horizons um, point of view from its inception. And so we were very familiar with the challenges that we had in the Wilmington LEAD program. One of those being specifically not having a dedicated kind of case manager who could get out into the community um, and really work with the individuals who were being referred. So we were kind of shifting the case management to our task program, which if you guys are familiar with tasks, some of you guys may be, um, they're very office-based. Our care managers were not allowed to be out in the community. Um, it wasn't really the peer support um, perspective. And so with this opportunity, we decided to look into finding a dedicated case manager, um, peer support specialist that could again, really enhance that lead program. So we looked at the research that was coming out of the Duke study early on and tried to address some of those barriers that they just um, shared with us as a group in expanding our diversional operation in New Hanover County as well. <clears throat> um, so again, we were able to expand, we added a position to the source program. And so we now have a, an additional peer support specialist. Um, we initially had the linkage coordinator as Billy stated, and then a peer with source. We added another peer who focuses both with our reentry population and heads up the lead case management um, and community outreach with our lead program. Um, I will say, sorry, let me backtrack. One other benefit of the additional funding is that we were able to provide our lead participants with the same services that you're going to hear um, that our source recipients receive and so, or participants receive. And so initially lead was really kind of an in-kind operation. Um, we had a collaboration from multiple stakeholders in the community and we linked individuals with services that were available through pre-existing funding streams. And so with our source funds, with the expansion, we are now able to offer, um, we have a specific dedicated funding stream for some of those services that we did not have before. So we can offer them paid housing in a recovery home. Um, we have that case manager dedicated to working with them specifically on goals such as employment education services. And so what you're looking at now, it's probably very small and hard to read on the screen, but this is our logic model. So kind of what we do, it's an overview of kind of what source looks like. And so basically the target population is adult men and women who are incarcerated and they're at risk of overdose. And again, those individuals who are involved in our lead program in Wilmington. Um, originally, source was really focused on New Hanover County Detention Center. Um, which is still the bulk of where our referrals come from. Staff are able to go into the detention center and provide services pre-release, um, link with individuals and build that rapport before they are released into the community. But we have expanded and we do accept referrals from other detention facilities. Um, so some of the state prisons um, have reached out after hearing about our program and staff have been wonderful um, in coordinating with caseworkers and getting uh, participants screened via the phone before the release. And if they're coming back to New Hanover County, really linking with those individuals um, and getting them set up with our program so that they have a soft, uh, warm handoff when they return. And so um, kind of what it looks like vaguely, and I'll let Billy sort of give more details, but staff receive the referral, they'll initiate um, with the individual or again, the caseworker, they'll initiate that screening process pre-release they'll help them develop um, a collaborative transitional plan 
um, that includes an array of service linkage. So medical, housing, transportation, employment, substance use, or access to harm reduction services. And then we provide ongoing case management and peer support. Um, additionally, you'll hear we provide transportation. So we physically will pick somebody up if they're being released from the detention center in New Hanover, or we may physically go meet them at the bus station if they're returning to the community from a, a prison setting, um, and then drive them to their recovery home, make sure they get where they need to be, pick them up and transport them to and from treatment services while they're engaged in the program. Um, and then again, just community-based peer support services and ongoing case management. <clears throat> So overall, the SOURCE program's goal is to decrease substance use, increase mental health, housing, and employment stability, increase knowledge related to overdose risks and the use of Narcan, uh, increase access to harm reduction services, and then decrease overdose, overdose deaths and recidivism. Um, and before I hand it over to Billy, so I'll just highlight one of the kind of unique things about our SOURCE program. So when we were thinking about you know, kind of creating this and what we really needed to target in the community. Historically, our reentry program at Coastal has been really focused on kind of the probation, parole, community supervision population. And so we have a pretty strong um, presence in reentry at Coastal through that avenue. So folks are court ordered to our reentry, another reentry program that we operate. They come out, um, they have a you know, dedicated probation officer that works closely with the team of case managers, and they receive a lot of these same services, but again, kind of under that court mandate. Um, and so what we were missing was really targeting those individuals who either came out and um, they weren't, you know, they weren't ready or they didn't want to be in a recovery. They wanted to maintain active use and they didn't have the supports to do that safely. So we wanted to target that population. And then also those individuals who may be released into the community um, and not be on any supervision. So they may not be on post release or have any ongoing um, kind of community oversight with DPS. And so this is strictly a voluntary program. Participants um, are met right where they are. There's no expectation that they enroll in treatment services. There's no expectation that they cease any kind of active use. Um, we just wanna offer whatever supports they want and um, are willing to accept to reduce again overdose risk and keep them safe. Um, and so we've been pleasantly surprised with kind of uh, the engagement level that we've seen. Um, and we are hoping to kind of move our reentry focus in the future, kind of keeping it in this continuum of let's serve everybody and have a place for everybody, no matter where they fall on that recovery spectrum. And so now I will turn it over to Billy. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, and pointing out, you know, this this program um, being person-centered and voluntary on their part, I feel like has been extremely beneficial um, to our, the individuals we serve as well as our success as a program. Um, so all, all program staff, um, myself, as well as our, uh, both of our peer supports, Elka and Jameer, all have lived experience. We're all uh, peer supports. I'm a peer support myself, as well as the linkage coordinator here um, with experience in both um, the justice, justice system and uh, substance use. So um, I feel like that helps us, uh, you know, relate to our folks and, you know, seem a little more empathetic, you know, being formerly an incarcerated individual and, you know, someone coming to me with a program. Um, so, um, just some quick, some quick bullets, uh, like, like Jamie said, um, since our inception and I believe our first enrollee was in June of 21, since then we've, um, and our original goal was 67 to engage with 67 individuals. Um, we, we've, we've, uh, since then we've engaged with 109, I believe is the exact number we're at right now. Um. So the way it works, we'll, we'll get a referral and it could be from different avenues within, within the community. Um, it could be a family member that's heard of a program. We have pamphlets or small handbooks um, that we disperse throughout the community. And I'll share one of those in the, in the chat here in a second. Um, but uh, it could be family members, friends. Um, we have uh, here in the New Hanover County Jail, like Jamie was saying, we um, we have another diversional program here at uh, 
coastal horizon. So we have some rapport within the jail, but um, we have a liaison community one inside the jail to where all of the housing unit or blocks within New Hanover County Jail, they have um, all the folks have uh, a kiosk that they have access to. And so if they're looking for services, they'll, exp they'll you know, put what they're looking for in this kiosk and it gets sent to community one inside the jail and community one makes the appropriate referral within the community. Um, but so community one will call us with a referral, you know, John Doe is seeking treatment. So we'll, we have access to the jail um, three times a week in which we can go in, um, meet with folks live and in person, um, not through glass or anything, um, and complete a screening with them. Uh, and I wanna say 99% of the folks we screen, screen for the source program are deemed eligible. Um, from there, and, and it, like I said, like Jamie was saying as well, um, we, we have began uh, accepting referrals throughout the state from different uh, correctional facilities such as Raleigh Women's uh, Prison, High Correctional, Granville Correctional. And um, I think the, a lot of our individuals that were here in New Hanover County have taken the, the pamphlets with them um, and dispersed them throughout, throughout the prisons to where folks, if they're returning to New Hanover County, they can um, have their case manager reach out to us. We've had, we've had uh, individuals write us. And then from there, we received their letter, find out what detention facility they're in um, and uh, get, get in contact with their case manager. Um, so yeah, and from there, from meeting with them incarcerated, we would screen them, pick them up directly from the jail um, upon their release where they're coming from the correctional facility, pick them up from the bus station um, or meet their parole officer as they're coming back into town and you know take them directly to their halfway house. We would coordinate their halfway house bed before their release. Um, and folks, we, we, we help them out with their entry fee and a couple of months of rent to, to help them get on their feet. So in, as you can see here in the program highlights, um, out of the 109 folks we've engaged with, 59 of those individuals have been linked to um, recovery homes here in the community. Um, and some of them multiple times, uh, you know, checking out of the, ha the halfway house or, you know, life and then having you know, to end up maybe going back so we can help them out with that as well. Uh, we, uh, so far, we've partnered with eight different recovery homes in New Hanover County or in Wilmington. Um, and I was telling, we, we talked with Dr. Ashkin about this all the time, we're blessed here in Wilmington um, with the amount of recovery homes. And these aren't just eight separate one location homes. Um, the majority of these uh, eight different recovery homes have multiple uh, locations here in uh, New Hanover County. So they're able to, uh, to um, you know, accommodate our uh, pretty large influx of, of individuals coming around of uh, incarceration. Um, out of those 109 folks that we've engaged with, uh, so far 78 of them have engaged with outpatient treatment services. Um, and that could be IOP, individual sessions, um, the bulk of them do engage with treatment services uh, here at Coastal Horizons. But if they wish to do that elsewhere, we accommodate that as that as well. And we um, we also help them out with transportation to and from if they you know, if their treatment hours are during business hours that we do have some IOP groups that start uh, in the evening as well. Um, 38 individuals have been linked with employment. So um, our peer supports have built rapport uh, with with different job sites throughout the community. And um, I want to say we, uh, we've had seven different individuals working over at uh, J. Michael's Deli here in town, straight out of incarceration. One of them got uh, promoted this past week to a management position. Um, so we're, we're stoked about, you know, our, the different jobs. And they, they'll reach out. They'll actually reach out to us via phone, via email, asking we have anyone looking for employment. Um, and like we were saying before, we do have a designated van that is our source van to help our source and lead folks uh, with their da daily transportation needs. That's to and from IOP, to and from you know, medication management, their MAT, um, as well as job interviews. Every, anything we can do to help someone to not wind up back, we, 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 we are slow <laughs> then, you know, we wanna help them stay away from blue clay. And blue clay is the road that our detention facility is on. 
Um, out of those 109 individuals, 70, 72 of them have accept, accepted Narcan on at least one occasion, some you know, multiple kits. Um, we have had at least two individuals uh, report to us um, you know, that they use the Narcan on other individuals in the community. One of those, uh, one of the folks, you know, we, we dispersed the nasal Narcan and she had used, it comes with the, the two pack. She had used one one day on the bus and the, the other uh, dose the next day downtown. So, um, and 39 of the 109 folks have engaged with MAT services once, once they're released from incarceration. So the way that works, like we, we would already have pre-release, pre have their um, CCA, we have a designated uh, clinician down at Coastal um, who that we correspond with to um, have the appointment set pre-release so that it, he, our folks, our MAT folks set they're put ahead of other, our other folks that aren't MAT so that when, when they're released, he can get them in for their clinical assessment and move them on to meet with the, uh, the physicians to get their MAT started ASAP. Um, but yeah, and as you can see in this picture right here, it's, kind of, it's a little blurry, but this is from our last graduation down at the bottom. Uh, this was this last month, um, Thanksgiving, and there are 10 individuals all together from both of our reentry programs that completed that day. Um, if any of you are ever interested in attending one of our celebrations or graduations, reach out to us because they we, we have them probably about every three to four months. Um, they're truly touching to hear some of the stories that are shared. So thank you all. Thank you both. So we will open it up to any questions. I can read what's in the uh, Q&A now, Jamie and Billy. Is the lead case manager a case manager or a peer specialist? It's really important for the field of peer work that they are not placed in roles outside of their scope. Correct. So, so our lead, um, our, our position that was created that lead funding. He is a certified peer support specialist. He's actually also a community health worker, um, which was something that we were able to accomplish under this funding stream as well. Um, but he does provide the case management services. So one of the things, again, we saw with the lead program in Wilmington is that kind of that case management umbrella was originally under our, our task um, program. And we just really lacked the ability to maintain one, a, a consistent, peer in the community. So we worked closely with um, the coalition, the harm reduction coalition in, in New Hanover, um, but between turnover and agencies, turnover at Coastal itself with our peer supports and, you know, law enforcement, we really had a lot of challenges kind of getting a consistent face, if you would say, for the program. And so um, Jameer has definitely been that consistent piece. And so he's from the area. Um, he's got a background working closely with I mean, being involved with law enforcement and the justice system, um, folks know who he is um, in a lot of our kind of target areas and the um, community. And he has done a fantastic job really getting out there and promoting the lead program. And so he provides that kind of, I'm going to walk right beside you as a peer support um, and then does meet that case management need. So it's really, it's a little bit more informal of case management, um, if you want to kind of look at it that way, because before, again, we were sort of just kind of lumping folks under our task umbrella. Um, a lot of folks that have encounters with law enforcement in the community have either previously been to task or know what task is, and so they really affiliated our lead program with like, I don't want to be, you know, I'm not on probation, I'm not going to task, I don't, you know, I don't want to get involved with that, um, and so we just implemented this position to really kind of separate um, and meet that need for the lead program, um, but he is a certified peer support and I'd say the bulk of his work is done under that peer support umbrella. Thanks, Jamie. We have another uh, question. Housing is such a huge need throughout the state for people who are at risk for overdose. It's amazing that you have a funding stream that assists people in getting housed. What are the rules and regulations of this housing? Can you give suggestions to other counties on how to receive funding for housing? 
I'll kind of take the first half of that and then turn it over to Billy um, because I truly it's 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 been staff that have built these relationships. But kind of from the program management side, um, we initially went after funding specifically for housing with our other reentry program um, when we sought out some SAMHSA funding. And so that was one of the things back in 2018 that they were highlighting um, in their announcements. And so we made a dedicated budget line for recovery housing. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of partnered with our local recovery homeowners, said, look, kind of what's an acceptable weekly rate? Um, you know, what would you guys be willing to accept from us? And then we based on, on budget, what can we afford per participant to kind of include in this um, funding? And so initially we paid 12 weeks of housing in our other reentry program. Um, and then a few years into that, we realized that one of the things we weren't, um, we didn't discuss and we didn't really cover was sort of that initial entry fee. And so we met, we were met with some challenges um, where we might be able to place somebody, but they were struggling to get the entry fee because that entry fee can be several hundred dollars up front. And if you're coming out of incarceration, that's great, we can pay your rent, but if you can't get in the door, um, we, we found that as a challenge. So we've learned, um, and then when writing the source proposal, you know, we specifically ask for funding in the budget to say, we initially started, I think, eight weeks in this funding stream and said, hey, we'd like to dedicate X amount, 250 for a recovery entry fee. And then um, we agree to pay eight weeks worth of housing for the individuals. And we've been blessed um, with this funding stream to have a little bit of flexibility in that, in that eight weeks. So some folks, you know, by the eight week mark are able to pay, pay their rent on their own or they have lined up independent housing and they're ready to move back to another location um, and they can pay rent independently. Or we've been able to extend that for an additional month for some of our folks that may be still engaged in IOP and not quite working full time or not um, at a place where they can pay that rent. So using that housing really as an incentive for folks. Um, that's probably the only regulation I'd say, Billy, that we have is if we're gonna do an extension, we're really focused on kind of the folks that are engaged. So again, with Source, you can be at any level of engagement. We kind of flow you from inactive to active if you're not interested in um, engaging in any services, you don't have to. We don't have the expectation that you do. Um, we'll just be here when you're ready to, if you choose to at a later, you know, later time. So um, the folks that get that extension are really our folks that are engaged. Um, and for whatever reason, um, it's a good fit for them. But I, I think ultimately the housing piece has been huge, one for our referrals, um, but the partnerships we've built in the community with housing has really been all at the staff level and it's just kind of snowballed. Yeah, yeah, and the housing partners, like Jamie said um, earlier, like we we do have the other reentry program. And previous to me coming over to the source program, I did work with the other reentry program. So I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to build uh, some of the community relationships um, with with the housing partners. Um, I remember when, like, when I first started, it's just going around and introducing yourself, um, helping them out with with drug screens. Like, if they need, you know, instant drug screens, we bring those over to them. Um, whatever it may be, I, I think one of the other questions that Margaret read was the rules or of of the recovery homes. Is that correct, Margaret? Yeah, just asking, like, what are some rules or regulations? So. Um, the majority of, of the recovery homes that we partner with are abstinent based. So um, unfortunately, you know, someone, someone comes in and they, you know, admit to usage or test positive. They're used, typically at the recovery homes, they're tested, you know, they're in the home two to three times a week. So when someone typically tests positive, I'll get a call from the halfway house manager. Hey, you know, John, John tested positive. Um, He's going to have to have to go, or you know, depending on what type, what substance it is, I should say. Um, so, sometimes you know, if they test positive for THC, they'd be willing to give them another shot, just um, as long as their 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 levels can be monitored through through their drug screens. But um, usually, the, each individual recovery home, home that we partner with, they have a different set of guideline guidelines and rules. We don't um, try to influence that too much. Uh, because they they do have other individuals that are coming to their housing, you know, from other other sources in the community. 
Yeah, and I'll add that I, that one of the things, again, as we continue to try to find additional funding and, and grow our reentry services, one of the things we have always talked about is having the ability to pay for housing that's not necessarily recovery home housing. Um, so there was some time during COVID with another funding source that we were able to kind of pay for temporary emergency shelter. And so we were able to put folks in a hotel room or, um, you know, pay for something short term. Um, but we have looked at long term trying to seek funding so that maybe we could pay a deposit fee for an apartment complex or help someone out with application fees or link them to a private landlord and pay um, for, again, housing that's not necessarily recovery home housing. So that is kind of one of the service gaps or areas that we um, continue to kind of seek out and target as we're looking for additional funding. Um, but again, in Wilmington, just like much of everywhere, housing and affordable housing is always a barrier in and of itself. So yeah, the justice involvement is just an additional barrier for folks. Thank you both. We have two more questions and we may have more in the chat, but I'm really focused on the Q&A right now. Uh, do you have issues with your partnering organizations using harm reduction versus abstinence or medication compliance? If so, how have you been able to handle it? Especially since some people in community have a strong distrust with mental health and programs attached with these kind of programs. I mean, I don't know, Billy, unless you can speak to it. I don't think the challenges of- are, I mean, you refer, are they referring to the housing piece or with the community partners? Yeah, I don't think, and maybe it is with the housing piece. Um, and if that person wants to add more to that question, please feel free to do so. Um, but it just says with partner organizations using harm reduction. So that may be around housing. And okay. I think that you, yeah. Both have touched on it a little bit, but if you want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, again, you know, the the recovery houses are typically abstinence based. Um, with that being said, I want to say, see, we we've got eight that we partnered with. I think only one of the recovery homes that we partner with uh, does not accept MAT. All the all the others do. Um, they they may not they may not put all the MAT folks in the same in the same houses as non MAT folks, but they do have specific houses for them. Um, so yeah, I want to say seven of the ones that we partner with do accept MAT, which is again another kind of unique and, yeah. and blessing um, feature of the. Thank you both. We have a comment in the chat, totally agree. Hopefully one day they all will operate from a housing first model. And interestingly enough, one of the next questions was also like, do you see recovery houses that are open to MAT? And it seems from what you shared, Billy, that is something that you see in, in all your partners except for one. So mm -hmm. I know that that is a significant jump from the way things used to be. Right, Jamie, we used to see it very differently. I was just about to say, I remember back in the early days of advisory board meetings and there only being one house, maybe two, and then now to hear that there are so many is, yeah, yeah. shift in mindset. Yeah, it, it right. varies, like, I, I'm sitting here thinking, I've got, we've got one, we've got one that doesn't accept it at all, accept MAT at all, we've got another, they only accept, you know, buprenorphine, um, so yeah, it just varies house to house. We have an additional question that says, are the houses that you partner with Oxford houses? Um, we, we have partnered with Oxford houses. Um, I prefer, I, I'm not gonna say I don't. We, I've got, I've got, we've got our, our local homegrown um, recovery homes that, that uh, partnered with beforehand. But we have a uh, partner with with Oxford houses. Um, it's just is not it's not as easy to get the referral in for an individual or get an individual accepted into the Oxford house. Say if I get a call, you know, we like we said, we screen folks while they're incarcerated um, and public defender. If I get a call from a public defender, hey, John's we're getting him into court tomorrow. I need him, you know, um, so I can't, in Oxford House, you have to call, you have to set up a, a, an interview and find out if they're accepted or not through the community. 
from the interview. Um, the recovery homes we partner with, um, I can uh, get someone accepted via text if need be. So, but we have partnered with Oxford Houses, yes. Thank you both. Some really rich conversation going on in the chat. If you all get a chance to participate in that, a lot of praise for the graduation coming from Evan Ashkin. I think he's attended one of the graduations in the past and just a lot of conversation around some of the things that you shared. Thank you both, Jamie and Billy. Uh, we're going to move on now to another um, program spotlight. Um, and we have Hollis McNeil here from Robeson County's Diversion Program. And so thank you for joining us today, Hollis. Did we lose Hollis? Not seeing her name on here. Let me see. Yeah, I don't see her in the attendees either. Hollis had joined earlier. I had saw the box open. I'm gonna to try to uh, reach out to Hollis and see um, if they would like to rejoin the meeting. Um, but I think the show could continue to go on. I, again, Jamie and Billy are gonna participate um, in the chat, but I think now is just a great time to turn it over and look at um, some resources and publications. So if we can move on and, and like I said, leave a little space at the end, because we do want to hear from Hollis, but I'll see if I can bring Hollis back to the meeting. And so I'll turn it over to our friends from the Duke Opioid Collaboratory. Thanks, Margaret. I'm going to try to share my screen. Are you all seeing the screen? Perfect. Great. So thank you for inviting us to present our work today. My name is Yu Jung Choi and my colleague Hilary Chen, and I will share our qualitative studies in medication for opioid use disorder and overdose prevention efforts in criminal legal settings in North Carolina. To tell you a little bit about us, we're from the Duke Opioid Collaboratory housed in the Department of Population Health Sciences at Duke. Through our work, our goal is to save lives, reduce stigma and mitigate the harmful impact of drugs using a harm reduction approach. Today, we'll briefly share two of the projects in our portfolio. The first project I'll discuss is on the overdose education and naloxone distribution in county jails. In 2019, in collaboration with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition and Overdose Response Strategy, two North Carolina county jails implemented opioid overdose prevention education naloxone distribution, and linkages to local care and support services. Between August and October 2021, our Duke evaluation team conducted interviews with five jail staff and peer support specialists who implemented the overdose prevention education and naloxone distribution programs in Catawba and Haywood counties. During the interviews, we explore the topics listed on this slide. Here, I'll highlight some recommendations for program improvements. Um, our interviewee suggested that the jail system and staff expand onboarding training for jail staff to include harm reduction, continue to use destigmatizing language, make sure there's a lot of time for relationship building between jail staff and peer support specialists, as strong relationship allows peer support specialists to have the more autonomy to do their job. Focus on the positive impacts of naloxone because seeing firsthand that naloxone saves lives changed several of jail staff's attitude toward the program and provided support more actively. And explore options for people who are incarcerated to keep their naloxone and overdose education materials if they're transferred to another facility or to be mailed to their home. There were times when the materials were discarded by jail staff because there wasn't much clarity around what personal belongings are allowed in transition. 
Our interviews also recommended that the program implementation team add additional resources to the education packet, including locations for MOUD and support services for food, housing, and transportation. And share local overdose data and program impact to facilitate program support and buy-in at the jail and in the community. And finally, hire peer support specialists from the start to help design the program. Every interviewee said peer support specialists with lived experience are what made the program successful. Thank you, John. The next we're going to talk about our as many of you know, collaborators with the program to provide medication to the disorder. Hillary, we're having some trouble with your audio. It's sounding a bit warbly. I just didn't want to interrupt you. No, no problem. Um, let me see if I can. Is it a little better now? Much better. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And sorry, my voice is probably a little hard to hear as well. I'm sick right now. So bear with me. Um, all right, so um, I will move on from that slide. It's kind of just background and everything I think you need to know is on that slide as well. Hillary, now it sounds like an echo. I hate to be like that worrisome person, like a gnat in your ear, but yeah. Not at all. Thank you for letting me know before I go on. Let me mute myself for a second and see if I can make some rearrangements. Okay, does that sound better? Yes, thank okay. you. Great. Yeah. Please keep please keep letting me know if it doesn't sound good. I appreciate the heads up. All right. So between June 2020 and February 2021, we conducted qualitative interviews with 14 collaborators involved in the design, implementation, and provision of the program. And you can see some of the interview topics that we explored on this slide. And you can move to the next. Thanks, Yujung. Uh, so the most important message from interviewees is, is that providing MOUD in this setting helps promote safety and reduce harm. And this was something that all the interviewees discussed as a main motivator for supporting the program. Some of the other key recommendations included the prioritizing, assessing available local resources, especially for linking individuals to care post-release was important so that programming can be tailored to your specific context. Identifying champions that can advocate for the importance of MOUD and help design and implement the program was incredibly important. Engage um, diverse stakeholders in the design and implementation process. And interviewees highlighted the importance of including individuals with lived experience and harm reduction and direct service organizations specifically. Collaborate closely with community MOUD providers to formalize linkages to care for individuals leaving the criminal legal setting and importantly involve peer support in this process, something you heard from Yu Jung as well. Um, provide ongoing education on MOUD and harm reduction principles to address stigma related to substance use for all people involved in planning, implementation, and provision of the program. Include procedures for data collection and evaluation plans to measure reach and impact of the program and to support continual improvements and adjustments. And finally, identify long-term funding sources to support sustainability of MOUD programming. And you can go to the next slide. So, this is our final slide with links to three resources that we've created to provide more detail on the findings that we super briefly just covered. Um, please do feel reach, free to reach out to us with any questions and we're excited to start sharing these documents. So please feel free to share those widely as well. Thank you both. And so we were looking forward to um, another presentation from a community-based program, uh, Robeson County Diversion. And so we won't be able to do that, um, but we're really excited um, to look at um, some of these programs and practice. Um, thank you so much to the representatives from Coastal Horizons that was a really um, informative presentation. 
I'll say thank you from the bottom of my heart to um, all of the researchers who participated in today's meeting, seen and unseen, because like, again, I'm like, I want to know that too. These are all questions that people have, and as we've seen through the chat and through the discussion, just like much more questions. These are all of the things that um, people want to know as they think about um, employing these strategies in their own communities, right? And so when um, I'm providing TA to programs and they want to know what's working, what's not working, um, how did um, programs navigate certain challenges, these are all of the questions that form the research um, that we were presented with today. So um, I don't know if you all know just how helpful um, some of these things will be to carry these conversations forward. So I thank you all um, for joining us today. And um, thanks to everybody. The chat was really powerful too. And so, um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you now, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Can you guys all see the slide on the screen? Yes, yes, it's just not in full screen mode. Oh. <laughs> well, I put it there. Okay, now can you see it? <laughs> no, but we can see the slide. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why it's not doing it. So hold on. I'm just going to tell you all what I'm going to say anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I just would love to say thank you to everyone who presented for us today. This was just, I find these meetings so helpful. I learned so much from everyone, every single OPDAC meeting. And so thank you so much for taking the time to share all this useful information with us. Um, thank you to everyone, Margaret and everyone on the planning team who made this happen today. It takes a lot of teamwork to get these meetings pulled together and every single meeting, I am just amazed at all of the work that we do in this state. Um, the recording and the slides and also the one pager will be distributed to our OPDAC listserv once the um, meeting recording and then the PowerPoint slides are made available. I will send that out to our OPDAC listserv as I mentioned and they will also be posted on our DHHS OP OPDAC webpage within the next week. Um, and then I just want to let you all know that our next meeting is scheduled for March of 2023. Um, we're still working on determining a date and a topic, and this meeting will be held in the hybrid format. So we will have the virtual component and then the in-person component at McKinnon Center. And as soon as more information is finalized, I will make sure, and the date is finalized, I will make sure to send that out through our OPDAC listserv. And again, thank you all so much for such a great meeting, and I hope everybody has a safe and relaxing holiday season, and we can't wait to see everybody in 2023. Have a great weekend, everybody.